We're so glad you're here. If you're visiting with us, if you're at Sparta campus, we welcome you. If you're in our Livingston campus, we welcome you today. We love you guys. Cookville South, hey guys, we're so glad you've joined us. And the new campus, Baxter, Life Church Baxter, we welcome you guys. Do you know y'all have the greatest administrative assistant on y'all staff. Her name is Montana Hendricks. I trained her. I raised her up. I prayed her into the kingdom of God. I equipped her to do every great thing she's doing, and y'all get the benefits of her. Just say thank you. Just say thank you. That's all I need from you is a thank you. We're glad you're here. For those of you who are joining us online all over the world, in fact, we know that many of you who are sitting here this morning, you moved here from other states, and the first time you heard about Life Church was online. So those of you watching us online, we welcome you, and especially to all of our friends in the correctional facilities, we welcome you. Let's give them a hand. Would you do that? This past week, Pastor Christian, our Sparta campus pastor, Pastor Bobby, and some other churches in the Sparta area came together, and they had a water baptism at the White County Jail, and I think they baptized 20 uh, inmates this week at the White County Jail, and we're so thankful for that. Let me just reiterate what Pastor uh, Davy said. If uh, When you turn on the news, when you see something on social media, be sure to pray for Israel. This is Ezekiel 38 might be unfolding right here in our very eyes. Uh, Israel is the, is the time clock of God. Whatever happens in Israel, the Bible revolves around what happens in Israel. So what we're seeing taking place right now in Israel could be Ezekiel 38 coming to pass. And let me tell you, those of you who are watching us online, if you don't know Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, this is the time to accept him. Amen. This thing could be wrapping up. So let me encourage you to find a local church to get involved in or accept Christ when we pray at the end of this message. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Hebrews chapter 12. We're so glad you're here. God bless you for coming. Hebrews chapter 12. Let's, let's begin reading with verse number one. And we'll read verses one and two. And I'm reading from the New Living Translation. Hebrews 12 verses one and two. Since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith, let us strip off every weight that shows, slows us down especially the sin that so easily trips us up. And let us run with endurance the race that God has set before us. We do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus, the champion who initiates and perfects our faith. Now notice this next sentence. Because of the joy awaiting him, he endured the cross, disregarding its shame. Now he is seated at the place of honor beside God's throne. If you were with us last week, I hope you gave some thought to, to the two questions I posed at the beginning of our lesson last week, and that was this. When was the last time you experienced one of those hilarious belly laughs? When was the last time, and how long has it been, since you became so tickled over something you found something so funny that you had to pause and catch your breath because you laughed so hard. I hope and I pray that you sought out a good laugh this past week. If you didn't, let me encourage you to be intentional about finding something healthy to laugh about in the next few days. In fact, if you're finding it difficult to find something that will stimulate laughter in your life, I encourage you to turn on your TV and watch the news from Washington, D.C. <laughs> that place is filled with clowns. It's better than a three-ring circus. Come on, come all, see our national congressman. They walk, they talk, they crawl on their belly like a reptile. I, <laughs> If you just need something to laugh about. Now, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Please don't email me. And don't email Pastor Bobby. I like being here. Don't email him. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. 
I personally and intentionally have chosen to laugh about what I see on TV. If I don't, I'll cry and feel hopeless and discouraged. You see, every day we're inundated with bad and sad news. You turn on TV today, and it's filled with the heartbreak and the, the war, the death, the t- torment that's taking place in the Middle East. You see crime running rampant in our cities. You watch social media, and it's dramaville on social media. We walk into our jobs. You walk into your companies, and as you walk in, rumors are already flying about the latest drama. Or what happened to so-and-so? Or can you believe so-and-so did this? Or can you believe the company's going to do this to us? Here's another one. How many of you have relatives and the only time you hear from them is to tell you something bad? Anybody know what I'm talking about? You see their names pop up on the phone and an uneasy feeling comes on you because the only time they call you is to tell you something bad. How many of our days are filled with worry and dread instead of joy and laughter? When was the last time someone said to you, hey, what's going on in your life? You're in such a great mood this week. You've been so joy. You've had a smile all week long. When was the last time someone said something like that to you? See, joyfulness and laughter has unfortunately become a rare commodity in our nation. We don't see it much. In fact, life has become so stressful that we continually look forward to the weekend. How many of us think, man, Friday's coming. Friday and Saturday's coming. I can't wait to get away. I watch some of you on on social media. You start a countdown 90 days before your next vacation, 89 days. Can I tell you, we get tired of seeing that (laughs) on social media. I'll say to Amanda, 74 more days, and they're going to the beach, them dogs, 74 more days. You start, we, we, life is so stressful, we continually are looking forward and projecting some moment that we can get out of this quagmire of drama and stress and forget it all and escape and have fun. And yet, unfortunately, many have to drink something or many have to take something to be able to relax and get themselves in a mood to have fun. You see, joy and laughter has become a rare commodity in our culture today. But that's the way it shouldn't be. It shouldn't be that way because God, especially for the children of God, is because God has placed a reservoir of everlasting, eternal joy in every one of his children. It's in us right now. The word joy means to be exceedingly glad, to delight in, and God has put that in us. It is God's will. It is God's will for us to experience an overflowing joy in our life regardless of what we're going through today. God wants you to be joyful. He wants you to be glad. He wants you to have delight regardless of what we're going through. Last week, I shared this with you, that joy is an inner appreciation. It's an inner appreciation, and it's a sense of satisfaction. It can be expressed in dancing and laughter and singing and shouting, but also it can be expressed in contentment, just gratitude, a general sense of gratitude, optimism, and a sense of freedom. Joy is a celebration in our hearts. Just joy is just the satisfaction of knowing everything's going to be okay. I don't care what I'm going through. I'm not going to let it get me because everything's going to be okay. Why is it going to be okay? Not because of what I feel, not because of what I'm experiencing, but because of what I know. Everything's going to be okay. Most of us have realized, haven't realized that we have a full supply of joy in us. Most of us keep trying to pursue this thing we call happiness. Last week, I shared with you that happiness is a wonderful emotion. 
It's a tremendous state of being, and I enjoy being happy. But as Christ followers, we have something richer, deeper, and more permanent than just happiness. See, happiness can never be maintained continually. You think about your week, this past week, just this past week, of the, all the different roller coaster rides, if you were trying to pursue happiness, maybe in the morning something good happened, maybe in the evening something bad happened, maybe in the afternoon you got a good, uh, a good phone call, but maybe the next morning you got a bad phone call. Maybe you woke up one day and you felt great, and by that night you didn't feel good. Happiness is totally, cannot ever be maintained constantly. Happiness is a glad feeling that depends on good things happening. Happiness is totally dependent on circumstances. And whereas joy is an inner delight, happiness depends on stuff on the outside going good. And the truth is, you and I cannot control all the stuff on the outside. You can't control your neighbors. You can't control your boss. We can't control the weather. We can't control the political system. We can't control nations. We can't control the economy. We can't control the stock market. We can't control a lot of things out here. And happiness needs all of this out here to survive. But joy don't need anything out here to survive. Happiness depends on circumstances. Happiness must have external conditions to be right for it to thrive. And we all know one moment the conditions are good, the next moment the conditions are bad. Pursuing happiness is like riding a roller coaster, up and down. But joy, on the other hand, is eternal. It's on the inside. It doesn't matter what's going on out here. It doesn't matter what anybody says, what anybody does, what the economy does, what governments do, what nations do, what neighbors do, what relatives do. It doesn't matter what they do. Joy is eternal, and its foundation is in the love of God. And here's the wonderful thing about the love of God. It never ceases, and it never diminishes. Joy is the celebration in your heart of a believer for what God has done. And then I shared this with you, and please don't forget it. I'm going to say it again. Joy is not dependent on a feeling. Joy is dependent on knowing. Joy is not dependent on a feeling. Joy is dependent on knowing. And last week I shared with you that every one of us as children of God have the joy of the Lord inside of us. You might not feel it, but you can know it. You have the joy of the Lord on the inside of you. When you and I accepted Jesus as our Lord and Savior, last night in our service, our Saturday night service, we had eight people raise their hand to accept Christ as their Lord and Savior. Well, when Jesus came into their heart to accept Jesus, to accept Christ, guess what else came into their heart? Joy. Joy. When you accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, the Spirit of God, came to live on the inside of you. Right now, the Holy Spirit is living on every inside of every one of us who have Jesus as our Lord and Savior. Now, you might not be experiencing joy. You might not be exercising it, but it's in you. Look what it says in Galatians 5. Turn over to Galatians 5, verse 22. Turn real quickly over to Galatians 5, verse 22. Notice what it says. The Apostle Paul, I'm going to read it from the New International Version. It says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Can I tell you something? As a Christian, every one of those... Every one of those are deposited inside of you. Well, I, got, I, I, I don't know about that, Pastor. I just don't know about that. My granddaddy had a temper. My daddy had a temper, and I just have a temper. Well, you might have a temper in the flesh, but in your spirit, man, which we want to be dominating our flesh, you've got self-control. You've got long-suffering. You have forbearance. You have gentleness. Every one of these wonderful attributes of the Holy Spirit. See, this is the nature of the Holy Spirit. This is the Holy Spirit's personality. This is the Holy Spirit's nature. 
And when he came to live inside of you, when you and I accepted Christ, his nature came to live inside of you. So every one of these things, including joy, including joy, is on the inside of you. Now let's go back to Hebrews chapter 12. I want to show you something. Turn to Hebrews chapter 12 real quickly again. And notice what it says in verse 1. Therefore, since we are surrounded by a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith, let us strip off every weight that slows us down, and especially the sin that so easily trips us up, and let us run with endurance the race that God has set before us. Now, the writer of Hebrews here is telling us, now, I want you, I want you to listen to what he's saying. He's telling us that we are, we, we Christians living nowadays, we are surrounded. Notice what he says. Since we are surrounded by a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith. You know what he's saying? He's saying every one of us are surrounded by people who have successfully navigated the drama, the pain, the heartbreak, the misfortune, the injustice of life. And they've been able to maintain their faith even after, after going through all of that stuff. Now, here's the truth. Satan, at times, will try to make us believe that we are the only ones going through what we're going through. Satan will try to tell you, Nobody understands what you're going through. You're the worst person. Nobody ever made it sin like you sinned. Nobody will ever understand that. Nobody's been hurt like you've been hurt. Nobody's been betrayed like you've been betrayed. Nobody has messed up like you've messed up. Nobody's been done long, wrong like you've done wrong. No company, nobody's ever experienced the bad treatment that that company treated you. Nobody's ever had a friend like that treat them like your friend treated you. Nobody's had a husband that's been unfaithful to them as many times as your husband's been unfaithful to you. See, Satan is always trying to get us to think our situation is different than anybody else's. And his tactic is to get us isolated. So isolation is a tool. Now listen, isolation is a tool demons use to control the narrative which they are whispering in your mind. Let me repeat that. Isolation is a tool that demons use to try to control the narrative that they're whispering in your mind. If Satan can keep us isolated, he will be the only voice we hear, and he can manipulate us with suggestions and oppression. That's why he wants us to be isolated. When we go through something difficult, what are we tempted to do? Get in a corner separate ourselves. I don't want to go to church. I don't feel like going to church. I don't want to talk to nobody. I don't want to talk to nobody. No, I'm not going to go see a counselor. I'm not going to, go, I'm not going to share that. I'm not going to tell nobody. That. What's Satan trying to do? He's trying to isolate you. Why? Because if he can keep us isolated, he is the only narrative. He's the only voice that we hear whispering in, his, in our ears and in our minds. But the writer of Hebrews says, now remember, regardless of what you're going through, regardless of the pain you're presently experiencing, you are surrounded by a huge cloud of witnesses. There's other people who've been through what you've been through. There's other people who've suffered torment and pain and betrayal and rejection and drama and stress and injustice just like you. And they successfully got through it. And he said, here's the way they got through it. He said, they kept their eyes on Jesus. Amen. Jesus left us an example of how to get through unhappy, miserable moments of life. The way he did it, notice what he says. Verse 2, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2. We do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus 
the champion who initiates and perfects our faith, because of the joy awaiting him, he endured the cross despite disregarding its shame. Now, remember what I said. Joy is not based on a feeling. Joy is based on a knowing. Now, notice what it says. We keep our eyes on Jesus. And he was able to get through the most horrific trial in life. Pain in life. He was able to get through it because he kept his eyes on the joy that was awaiting him. The Bible says since he had his eyes on the joy that was awaiting him. See, it's not a feeling. It's a knowing. He knew that the joy was ahead. He said he was able to endure the cross. Let me ask you a question. Do you think that felt good when he hung on the cross? Do you think he was feeling happy and excited when they were beating him to the point that the Bible says he was unrecognizable? Do you think he was excited and, and just laughing when he was hanging naked for the public to see? The very son of God naked for the public? What shame, what embarrassment. Yet the Bible says he endured that unpleasant moment, that terrible moment, that stressful moment, that painful moment, that horrific, unjust moment. He endured that, and he endured the shame, not because it felt good, not because it was funny. He endured it because of what he knew was coming, joy, joy. And see, what happens to most of us is that we encounter some difficult moments in our life and we think life is over. Life is hopeless. Let's give up. Let's quit. Here's one. We get involved in church and somebody in the church does us wrong. And you know what we're tempted to do? Quit church. Why? Because we have gotten our eyes off the joy that's awaiting us. Remember what the Bible says? Weeping endures for the night, but joy comes in the morning. Here's something to remember. The joy of the Lord doesn't eliminate the pains of life. The joys of the Lord doesn't eliminate the pains of life. The joy of the Lord helps us to survive the pains of life and continue to live life with hopeful anticipation. How many people have I worked with over the years who've gone through the heartbreak, the pain, the horrific, terrible drama of divorce, and I'll meet with them afterwards, and they'll say, I ain't never getting married again. I'm never going to trust another man. All men are a bunch of bums. They're terrible. I know four like that, but not all of them are like that. I ain't messing with women. They're just users. I'm not messing with women. I don't care how pretty they are. They are users. I'm not messing with them. I, I say, you dating anyone? Do you have anybody of interest in your life? Nah, I ain't got time for that. They've taken my money once. I ain't got no money left. They don't care nothing about me. See, the joy of the Lord doesn't eliminate the pains of life. The joy of the Lord helps us to survive those pains and continue to live life with hopeful anticipation. For the joy that was set before him, he endured that pain. For the joy that was set before him, he disregarded the shame. Why? Because he knows weeping might be going on right now, but joy's coming in the morning. Amen. There is a joy. Can I tell you something? You might be going through hell right now. And I know a church this size, there's always somebody going through grief, betrayal, a bad report from the doctor. There's always somebody going through injustice. You've been done wrong at work. There might be something going on in your family where you've been treated wrongly. It might be something going on at school where you've been made fun of and bullied. 
But I want you to understand the pain might be today, but if you'll keep your eyes on Jesus and understand knowing that God is going to take care of you, he will never leave you nor forsake you. There might be some of you who right now say, I don't know how we're going to pay our bills. The truth is my God shall supply all of my needs according to his riches in glory. See, that's what we know. We might feel like we're going under. We might feel like we're going under, but what we know is that my God will supply all of our needs according to his riches and glory. We might feel like we've only got a few weeks or months to live, but what we know is either to live as Christ, if he heals us, we're going to live for him on this life, and if he doesn't heal us in this life, boy, we're going to have a party over there on the other side. See, to live is Christ, to die is grain. That's why the apostle Paul said, oh, death, where is thy victory? Oh, grave, where is thy victory? Oh, death, where is thy sting? I don't dread you anymore because I know what's coming for me. Amen. See, happiness depends on a feeling good all the time. Joy is dependent on knowing that my God's going to take care of me regardless of what's going on. Now, here's something I want to tell you about joy. I got 12 minutes left. Joy, the joy of, your, of the Lord is your strength. It will strengthen you spiritually, emotionally, and physically. You see, the city of Jerusalem was defenseless, and the walls of Jerusalem was broken down. The gates of the city, which were to monitor who came in and who came out, had been burned. So the enemies of the children of Israel 2,500 years ago uh, would come in and go. Thieves would come in and go, and they'd pillage the village and leaving the people vulnerable. Nehemiah, there's this guy in the Old Testament by the name of Nehemiah. He hears about the walls of the city being broken down. And he understands this is not God's will for his city. So he takes it upon himself to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. He gathers a group of people, of craftsmen, and for two months, nonstop, day and night, encountering challenges and naysayers, Nehemiah completes the task of rebuilding the walls. We pick up the story, go to the Old Testament, go to the book of Matthew, take a left, and go to the book of Nehemiah. Nehemiah chapter 8, verse number 1. Nehemiah chapter 8, verse number 1. All the people assembled with a unified purpose at the square just inside the water gate. I was just there a month ago. They asked Ezra, the scribe, to bring out the book of the law of Moses. What's the law of Moses? Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. They're reading the Old Testament book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had given to Israel to obey. Now look at verse 2. So on October the 8th, what's today? What's today? Over 2,500 years ago today. The priest brought the book of the law before the assembly. What are we doing? We're reading you the book of the law today before the assembly of the saints which included the men and women and all the children old enough to understand. See, going to church and having church service is not some new thing. It's been going on for thousands of years. He faced the square just inside the water gate. Now, notice this. From early morning until noon and read aloud to everyone who could understand, all the people listened closely to the book of the law. Now, here's what I want. You're in the early service. The Bible says they came to the early service, they stayed at the 10 service, and they stayed at the 11 service. And you think Pastor Bobby's long-winded? <laughs> you think I'm long? These boys right here, they were in church service for at least four hours. I don't know about you, I get hungry. No telling how many fraps, no telling, if we had four-hour church service, no telling how much money we could give out of the coffee shop. To me. That's what we need to do. <laughs> I just had a revelation. We need to increase. If we want to bless more ministries, let's increase the length of our service. We'll have two things happening. We'll have to hire more people to clean the bathrooms, but we'll get more money coming in from the coffee shop. Verse 5, Ezra stood on the platform in full view of all the people. When they saw him open the book, 
they rose to their feet. Notice there was a honor, a respect, an awe for the word of God. Then Ezra praised the Lord, the great God, and all the people chanted, Amen, Amen, as they lifted their hands. Lifting up hands in worship has been a thing for thousands of years. Then they bowed down and worshiped the Lord with their faces on the ground. Now, verse 9. Then Nehemiah the governor, Ezra the priest and the scribes, and the Levites who were interpreting for the people said to them, Don't mourn or weep on such a day as this. For today is a sacred day before the Lord your God. For the people had all been weeping as they listened to the words of the law. Now, why were they weeping? They wept because it had been so long since they had heard the word of the law read publicly. They wept because they had, as a people, had fallen so short. They were convicted of their sins and their lives. And they wept because many of their families wasn't there. Many of their families were still slaves and prisoners in other countries. And we pick it up, pick it up in verse 10. And Nehemiah continued. Nehemiah continued. Go and celebrate with a feast of rich foods and sweet drinks. Hallelujah. That's my kind of church. Rich foods and sweet drinks. Can I get an amen in the house? Amen. And share gifts of food with people who have nothing prepared. This is a sacred day before our Lord. Don't be dejected and sad. Why? For the joy of the Lord is your what? Strength. Strength. Their family wasn't with them. Their sin and their shame was right before them. The pain of what they had missed was on their mind. They realized how far they had fallen from God. They realized the plight of their nation that they had let again in such a plight of sin and corruption. And it caused them to weep and to be sad and dejected. And notice what he says, regardless of the moment that you're living in, don't be that way. The joy of the Lord is your strength. Stop thinking about your past. Stop thinking about what you don't have and who's not here and where you missed it. Don't allow regret to swallow up your moment. This is a day of celebration. The joy of the Lord is your strength. Listen to me. Joy is a spiritual force that helps us release our faith. It strengthens us spiritually and promotes healing in our bodies. The Bible says, a merry heart does good like a medicine. A merry heart does good like a medicine. Medical science has proven that laughter will cause your blood pressure to go down. Laughter improves your mental health. The Maryland Center of Medical Advancement just recently released that laughter will improve your heart health. It causes your blood vessels to expand when you laugh. Laughter releases, after you have a good laugh, uh, medical uh, science has proven that your muscles relax for at least 45 minutes and you get into a place of rest after a good uh, last. Laugh. You know that to be true. Have you ever just laughed, 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 and then you have to sit down and go, Phew. <laughs> That's good for you. You're finally relaxing. A merry heart does good like a medicine. But see, you can't wait till the circumstances get right before you do it. You got to tap into the joy of the Lord. That's always there. Now, let me share one more thing, and then we'll close, because I got to go up there to the old people. One more thing before we. Have you ever wondered why some folks seem to get their prayers answered and you are hit and miss on your prayers being answered? In fact, the things I've heard over the years, I'll ask people, how's your prayer life? And people always say this. Well, I don't pray enough. Well, no, no. Chances are very few of us pray enough. But I ask them, why don't you pray? Well, I don't have time. And every once in a while, I'll have somebody get real honest with me. 
And I'll say, why don't you pray? You know it's good for you. Why don't you do it? Every once in a while, somebody will get really honest and say, well, you know, to be honest, I just don't ever get my prayers answered. I pray, and it just seems like I'm doing it out of a ritual because I pray and pray, and nothing ever gets answered. Have you ever listened to some folks continually talk about what the Lord's doing in their life? Every time you talk to them, well, God did this, and God did this, and God answered this prayer, and you're sitting there thinking, I don't even remember the last time. I've got a testimony of what God did for me. I can't remember when God did anything special for me. Let me show you a verse of Scripture that's hidden in the Bible, but if you'll grab hold of it, it will change your life. It did mine. Turn with me to Isaiah chapter 12, verse 2 and 3. Isaiah chapter 12, verse 2 and 3, out of the NIV. Listen, the prophet Isaiah says this, surely God is my salvation. He says, God's my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid. The Lord, the Lord himself is my strength and my defense. He has become my salvation. I'm going to tell you, this is a good verse to memorize. Let me read it again. Surely God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid. The Lord, the Lord himself is my strength and my defense. He has become my salvation. Now notice the last sentence. With joy, you will draw water from the wells of salvation. The Bible says when we accept Christ as Lord and Savior, we have a well. Our spirit becomes a well of everlasting life that springs up to everlasting life. That's what it says. You have a well in you of salvation. That's what the Bible says. That's what Jesus said. When you accepted Christ, as your, there's a well of water springing up into you into everlasting life. Now, the Bible says here, you know how you get that water out? What's the water? The water is the benefits of salvation. The water is the, the results of salvation. Answered prayer, favor, healing, blessings, God working in your life. That's the water. You know how you get the water out? He says, it's with joy you draw the water out. I was raised in a praying family. My granddaddy was a pastor. My grandmother was the chief intercessor of our little church. My mama's an intercessor today. I was raised to pray. When I was 11 years old, I remember we had a revival, and they called a prayer meeting all week long, and I stayed with my grandmother in the summer. It was a summer revival, and every day she'd make me come in from playing in the yard to pray for one solid hour at 11 years old. You talking about hell. They playing foos, they're playing wiffle ball in the front yard, and I'm back there, God help us, God help us, God help us. <laughs> I was taught to pray. I prayed all my life. I just thought you're supposed to do it, and I thought that's what made God happy. And when I became at 25 the pastor of Trinity in all good, I just it was in it was terrible. There was no money. 29 adults, that's all we had. Couldn't pay the bills. They were months behind on their mortgage payment. Couldn't pay us as pastors. And all I knew to do was pray. And for two solid years, every day, I would pray for at least two hours. I'm not exaggerating. My wife will tell you the truth. I would go to that sanctuary and pray every day, Monday through Friday, for at least two hours. I didn't know what else to do. I'm 25. I don't know what to do other than pray. That's what I'd seen my parents do and my grandparents do is just pray. In the wintertime, I would take an overcoat and a blanket because we barely turned the heat on. We only had the heat on in the sanctuary high enough to keep the baptistry, the pipes from freezing. I can remember praying in that sanctuary in January and see my breath when I prayed. It was so cold. 
And one day I was in there just praying after a couple years, and it just, I was just worried. And then I would cry. Oh, I would cry. Oh, God, we're not, we're going under. Oh, God, we're going under. We can't pay our bills. Oh, God. And, you know, I'd tell him, I'd say, you know, when this church was founded, I was 10 years old. I didn't have nothing to do with this mess. And you sent me up here. This is bad. This is bad. Why would you do this to me? I mean, I'd just weep and I'd cry, and nothing ever got changed. God never answered my prayers. And then I discovered something. After two years of futilely praying, crying, weeping for hours, I discovered something. God's not moved by need. God's moved by faith. Amen. I know it's hard to grasp, but after two years of telling him how bad we were, and how bad things were, and what our need was, he hadn't done nothing. See, God's not moved by need. If he was moved by need, there wouldn't be one hungry child in the world. God's not moved by need. If he was, if he was moved by need, there wouldn't be one sick person in the world. God's not moved by need. If he was moved by need, there would be no problems in the world today because this world's in great need in every area. But God's not moved by need. He's moved by faith. And one day after praying, I was laying on the floor and I just started, got tired of praying and crying. And I opened my Bible and it just fell open. I'm going to tell you, it happened just like, it fell open to 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 6. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 6, notice what it says. But this I say, he who sows sparingly, shall also reap sparingly. He who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Now, I didn't have nothing to sow, so I felt bad after reading that verse. Have you ever read your Bible and felt worse after you read your Bible? <laughs> so let each one give as he purposes his in heart, not grudgingly or necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. Cheerful giver? I have nothing to give. Then I read verse 8. And God is able. Bang. Light switch went on. And God is able to make all grace abound toward you that you, having all sufficiency in all things, may have an abundance for every good work. It was like something, suddenly something clicked. And laying there on that cold floor, I saw it. I had spent two years telling God how big my need was, how bad my lack was, how terrible our condition was, instead of telling my lack and my need how able my God is. Amen. I got it. And that day, I start praying and crying. Oh, God, I'm dying. We're not going to be able to pay our bills. Oh, God, nobody's coming. They're going to shut it down. In fact, I had one of the ladies come up to me and said, I've got a word from the Lord. I said, oh, hallelujah, hallelujah. She said, yeah, I had a dream, and I saw padlocks on our doors. We couldn't pay our bills. How many of you know, as a young pastor, that's not the word of the Lord <laughs> that you want to hear? But I saw it. I've been crying and praying and weeping, belly aching about how bad things were. And then I saw, I got to stop doing that because with joy, you draw waters out of the well of salvation. And suddenly I switched. That moment I switched. Oh, God, you're able. My God's able to supply all grace needed for ministry. I looked up that word grace. It was some, S-U-M, the totality of earthly blessings and all power and equipment needed for ministry so that you'll have a sufficiency in all things and abound to every good work. I said, Lord, you're able. Glory to God, you're able. And that changed my prayer life. And when, I, when I, the bill would come due, I wouldn't say, oh, God, we can't pay our mortgage. I'd say, oh, God, you're able. You're able to give me a sufficiency in all things and abound to every good work. My whole prayer life changed. I'd get to looking forward to praying. I'd get so happy praying, not because of what I was experiencing. The bills were still high. The people were still few. But I know, see, joy is not in what you feel. It's in what you know. Amen. I knew that God was able. And things turned around. 
totally turned around simply because I started drawing waters out of the wells of salvation with joy instead of crying and weeping. The joy of the Lord is your strength, and it's inside of you right now. It doesn't depend on what you feel. It depends on what you know. Stand with me, would you? I went six minutes and 30 seconds over. Thank you for being so attentive. If you're here this morning and you've never accepted Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, can I tell you something? We're living in serious days. We're living in serious days. What's happening in the Middle East could be the precipice to the end. And if you don't know Christ, if you've been playing around with this thing and something keeps pulling you to accept Christ, but you stay in that state of independence and rebellion, I encourage you, I plead with you, surrender today. This is the day to surrender. And if you've never accepted Christ as your Lord and Savior, and you know you should, or if you've walked away from him, life just interrupted your faith, and you've walked away from him, and you know, man, something's getting ready to happen in this world. I need my life straight with Christ. I need to make sure I'm okay with the Lord. If you're ready to come back home, if you've never accepted him as Christ, as Lord and Savior, or if you're ready to come back to Father's house and you want to pray a simple prayer with all of us, raise your hand right now. Raise it up real quickly, would you? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody over here? Thank you. Thank you. God bless you. Thank you. Let's all pray this prayer. Heavenly Father, I believe that Jesus died on the cross. I recognize that time is short. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for giving me this opportunity to get my life straight with God. I accept you now, Jesus, as my Lord and Savior. In Jesus' name, amen. Welcome to the family of God. We bless you in Jesus' name.